absolute pleasure again to have you join us back at Bite Medicine for yet another webinar um, and we're going to be continuing our cardiology theme. For those of you who joined last time I did a, an ECG webinar which is available on the website um, and we're carrying on with that theme looking at acute coronary syndrome. My name is Shweb um, and I'm one of the co-founders of Bite Medicine and it's an absolute pleasure to have you all with us on this Thursday evening. So all very dedicated students no doubt. Um, so, as I said, we've done ECG basics, um, and that's what I covered last time, and today I'm going to be going over acute coronary syndrome. What acute coronary syndrome is, how you diagnose it, and how you manage the condition. And then in a couple of weeks, we'll be covering second part of ECGs, going over complex ECG cases. This should take about 50 minutes or so, and we're doing this webinar in association with um, GKT MSA, which is the King's College London um, MSA, and it's an absolute pleasure, and we are delighted to be working with them. The slides and recordings are up on our website as always, so please do check that out. Um, so for those of you who don't know, we have a question bank and textbook available, and we currently have a discount code by the token of GKT2021. So if you use that code, you get somewhere between 20 to 30% off. I can't quite remember exactly how much, but it's a decent discount. Um, and our question bank and textbook are, are very thorough, case-based approach, uh, going right from first steps through to diagnosis and pathology and we've got some very good reviews and happy students using it so please do check it out um, and let us know what you think. Um, and following on from this webinar next week we'll also have a competition where prizes are up for grabs of up to £100 where myself and Azeem will be going through a bunch of SBAs and the winner of that competition will win £100. So please do tune in uh, next week or the week after, 27th of February, sorry. Okay, without further ado, let's go into acute coronary syndrome. What is acute coronary syndrome? Well, it comprises of three conditions, three separate condi conditions, unstable angina, NSTEMI, and STEMI. So before we get started, my question to you guys is, what, what is the difference between unstable angina and stable angina? You can just um, comment in the chat. Any takers for what is the difference between stable and unstable. So we've got this idea of rest pain. So very good. With unstable angina, you should have pain at rest, okay? That's different from stable angina where exertion brings on the pain. Key difference, and we'll come into that later. Okay, read through this case and let me know what you think. 65-year-old plumber presents Amy with a four-hour history of central chest pain and shortness of breath. Constant pain, doesn't radiate or change when he moves position. He's sweaty. He's got a background of hypertension and rheumatoid arthritis, and he has a 10-year smoking history. Um, those are his observations. Someone has quite rightly said high risk factors for ACS. Um, so are we worried about this patient or not worried? So you guys are the doctors or the physician associates seeing this patient in A&E and you will see this commonly. Um, and we have takers for worried, good. Yeah, I mean, you know, anyone with chest pain should make you worry. Um, any 65 year old with chest pain should really make you worry because you need to think, you know, what are the serious things this could be? Um, one of those serious causes of chest pain is, of course, acute coronary syndrome. So you need 
be worried. And he's high risk. He's got hypertension. He's a smoker. Um, he's also got rheumatoid arthritis, which is a risk factor for ACS and myocardial infarction. Okay, have a look at his ECG. Don't comment what you think, just because it's going to come up in the next question. But have a look at that ECG. Let it sink in. Um, please don't comment in the chat what you think the diagnosis is. And then we'll come on to the question. I'll give you about 15 seconds to look at that. Okay, let's let me see if I can find. Okay, so what is the diagnosis? Um, someone's mentioned the, the possible answer in the chat. Please, uh, please refrain from uh, using the chat for answers in the future. So if you log on to menti.com and put in the code 65987095, you should be able to answer the question and we can go through the options. Okay, let's have a look what you guys think. So we think inferior ST elevation myocardial infarction. Why? Why do you think that? Why is that? the answer. Good. Two, three, AVF. Um, so let's go back to the ECG. So if we look at this ECG, and please do revisit my ECG webinar that I did a few weeks ago, which goes through the basic principles. Um, if we go through this, where is their ST elevation? So it's in leads two. So if you look at one is normal, the ST segment is nice and flat. But if you look at two, the ST segment is raised. The same for three and the same for AVF, okay? So firstly, when you look at an ECG in the context of a possible myocardial infarction or acute coronary syndrome, you need to think, is the ST segment elevated or not elevated? Looking at this ECG, we can see there's clear ST elevation. Therefore, this patient is having an ST elevation myocardial infarction, STEMI. The next thing you need to think is where is this occurring in the heart? Is it anterior, inferior, lateral, um, or posterior? The distribution of ST elevation in is in these two, three, and AVF, and that is the classical pattern of an inferior myocardial infarction. So going back very briefly, revisiting ECG vectors, a problem in two, three, and AVF suggests inferior part of the heart is affected. Okay, A problem in AVL lead one, V5, and V6 suggests the lateral part of the heart is affected. And a problem in V1 to V4 suggests the anterior part of the heart is affected. Please do revisit the ECG webinar. If this doesn't make sense to you because we went into it in a lot of detail then. But basically, you can use the distribution of the leads to figure out which part of the heart is being affected. Um, okay, moving on to the next question on Menti. Please don't answer in the chat. Which of the following coronary arteries is affected in an inferior myocardial infarction? So if this person is having a, an inferior MI, which of the following arteries is affected? Left anterior descending, left circumflex, right coronary, posterior descending, or diagonals? 
right coronary artery. Good. So the right coronary artery is responsible for the inferior part of the heart and therefore in an inferior myocardial infarction, it's the right coronary artery that will be the problem. This is a nice summary slide of why those answers were correct. So remember two, three and AVF is an inferior myocardial infarction caused by a problem in the right coronary artery. Leads one, AVL, V5 and V6 is a lateral myocardial infarction caused by a problem in the left circumflex artery. The problem in V1 to V4 suggests an anterior septal MI and that's responsible uh, the left anterior descending artery is responsible for that territory, okay? So by working out which leads are affected, you can figure out which part of the heart is affected. And if you know which part of the heart is affected, you can figure out which artery is affected. So that's the way to work through it. And if we go through the blood supply, um, you have the left and right main coronary arteries. The left splits into the left circumflex and the left anterior descending. So as you can see, the left circumflex wraps around the lateral part of the heart, and that's why problems in the left circumflex will lead to a lateral MI. Whereas the left anterior descending comes straight down, and that supplies the anterior and septal part of the heart. So problems in the left anterior descending artery will cause an anterior septal myocardial infarction. Whereas the right coronary artery wraps underneath the heart and gives off the posterior descending artery. And together these supply the inferior and the posterior part of the heart, okay? So it's important to know a bit of the anatomy and the ECG vectors to piece together the puzzle and figure out which part of the heart is affected. In this instance, it was the right coronary artery, which supplies the, as I said, the inferior and the posterior part of the heart. So acute coronary syndrome, what is it? It comprises of three different diseases, as we described. Myocardial infarction, which can be further split up into STEMI or NSTEMI, as well as unstable angina. So I came across this interesting statistic that was recently published in The Lancet, uh, not more than a couple of months ago. And in 2019, there were approximately 3,000 admissions for acute coronary syndrome a week in the UK. But in March 2020, that dropped by almost 50%. Um, any, re any reasons, you know, any ideas as to why there was such a significant drop in March? Yeah, COVID. Um, I found that really interesting because it just means that a bunch of patients with potential myocardial infarctions were just sitting at home and not turning up to hospital. Um, so really interesting paper in the Lancet. But the point of this is acute coronary syndrome is actually quite common. Um, as PAs, as F1s, as F2s, you know, whatever level you're at, if you're an a &E, you're definitely going to see someone with acute coronary syndrome. So it's really important you know how to manage it. The risk factors in general can be split up into non-modifiable and modifiable. It's kind of what it says on the tin. Non-modifiable things are those risk factors which you can't help. You know, your age, gender, um, genetics and family history, ethnicity, these are all things that you cannot um, modify from a risk factor point of view. Whereas there are modifiable risk factors, which include smoking, diabetes, blood pressure, obesity, you know, hyperlipidemia, cocaine. Um, there are a bunch more, but these are sort of the key ones. So what's going on in terms of the pathophysiology? Well, it all starts off with accumulation of fat in the blood vessel wall. And these fat molecules are oxidized by macrophages and phagocytosed to form foam cells. So just taking this a step back, if we look at this diagram here, this is a, obviously a blood vessel and you have the blood vessel wall. And actually, most, basically by your teenage years, you've already started this process. 
So by the 10 year mark, your teenage years, you've already started to accumulate fat in your blood vessel wall. Um, so just to go through that again, you have fat in your blood that then leaks into the blood vessel wall. It's oxidized and taken up by macrophages to form foam cells. Um, that eventually then forms a fatty streak. And as I said, the fatty streak is something that is seen in teenagers. So this process happens very early on. Over time, that fatty streak develops into a plaque, an atheromatous plaque, which is over here. What happens is over time, you have deposition of extracellular matrix, smooth muscle, calcium, and that all builds up in the blood vessel wall to form this plaque, which reduces blood flow through the coronary artery. Okay, so you start off from this foam cell stage all the way into your sort of 50s and 60s, you're going to have good going atheromatous plaques. And this is what predisposes someone to angina, unstable angina, and eventually myocardial infarction. Looking at this in a bit more detail, from a pathophysiological point of view, what's the difference between angina and myocardial infarction? Well, it's in the name, myocardial infarction, okay? Infarction means there's muscle death. In angina, you do not have muscle death. That is the key difference. So looking through angina first, you have a plaque which grows and that limits blood flow through the coronary artery. That leads to ischemia, you're going to get less oxygen being delivered to the heart muscle, and that causes chest pain and shortness of breath, the classical symptoms of angina. If the narrowing is very severe, you will get that pain at rest, and that's known as unstable angina. Okay, So stable angina, as we said, is when you get chest pain on exertion because you have a plaque and you can't deliver enough oxygen to your heart on exercise. Unstable angina is when that plaque is so large that the blood supply is so limited that even at rest, the oxygen supply to your heart is not sufficient, and therefore you develop pain at rest. Key difference between stable and unstable angina from a pathophysiological point of view. In myocardial infarction, what happens is we have this final stage here. It's the plaque ruptures, so it bursts, okay? And when it bursts, you have lots of thrombogenic material being released. When I say thrombogenic material, I mean things which are going to form clots, like collagen, for example. This will allow platelets to bind and form a thrombus as you can see here, and that will only cause further stenosis of the blood vessel. So from a pathophysiological point of view, in myocardial infarction, the atheromatous plaque ruptures, platelets adhere to the ruptured plaque, you form a thrombus, and you get further blockage of the coronary artery. You then have muscle necrosis and infarction. As it says here, the plaque ruptures, you get platelets adhering and thrombus formation, severe ischemia, really, really low levels of oxygen really reaching those heart muscle cells, which eventually leads to infarction. What's the difference between an NSTEMI and a STEMI? Well, an NSTEMI occurs when you have partial occlusion with partial infarction, and a STEMI occurs when you have complete occlusion with transmural infarction. We'll touch on this point in more detail in a bit, but essentially, with an NSTEMI, the coronary artery is not completely blocked. There is still some blood flow. And the infarction doesn't take place over the entire thickness of the wall. Only partial thickness infarction occurs. With a STEMI, the, the coronary artery is completely blocked. You get infarction of the total thickness of the myocardial wall. That is the key pathophysiological distinction between an NSTEMI and a STEMI.
and this picture shows it quite nicely actually. So um, in an in a STEMI, it's complete thickness. So the entire thickness of this myocardial wall will be infarcted. In an N STEMI, it's only partial thickness. So you might have half the thickness of the wall being infarcted, but the other half is okay. And that is the key distinction between a STEMI and an N STEMI. Good. Um, so briefly touching on the types of angina, because this is again important to understand. We have stable angina, unstable angina, decubitus angina, and Prinz metal angina. In this lecture, we're mainly concerned with unstable angina, as this falls under the umbrella term of acute coronary syndrome. All the other types of angina do not fall under the acute coronary syndrome term and are managed completely differently. Sue so said, angina typically consists of chest pain radiating into the neck or the left arm or into the jaw. It gets worse on exertion and the symptoms should be relieved after taking GTN within five minutes. That's your classic angina. Then you can further subdivide it into stable, unstable, decubitus, or prince metal. So stable angina, as we said, it's brought on by exertion, relieved by rest. Unstable angina occurs pretty much at rest, and when you exert yourself, it gets even worse. And that's the key difference, as we've mentioned. Decubitus angina and prince metal angina are rare. So decubitus angina occurs when you lie flat, and prince metal angina occurs due to coronary artery vasospasm. So the actual coronary artery starts to randomly contract, and that reduces blood flow to the heart. What classically causes coronary artery vasospasm? Uh, yes, yeah, sorry, someone said GTN is, is um, oh, sorry, co yeah, cocaine, that's right. So there, there's actually a few different nitrates, I should probably touch on that, there's a few different nitrates that you can use in heart conditions. Um, and GTN is a very specific fast acting agent, which stands for glycerol trinitrate. Okay, and the reason it's used is because it's fast acting, you can just pop it under the tongue or use it as a spray, um, and it should relieve the pain quickly. The way it works is it's a vasodilator or attempt to increase blood flow to the heart muscle. Okay, so we've gone over types of angina. What about the types of MI? So we have a STEMI versus an N-STEMI, and we've touched on this. STEMI involves complete occlusion of the coronary artery with transmural infarction, N-STEMI involves partial occlusion with partial thickness infarction, also called subendocardial infarction. The hallmark of a STEMI, it's in the name, ST elevation, and the hallmark of N-STEMI is either ST depression or T-wave inversion. But how do we classify MIs based on their cause? Does anyone know of the different types of MIs based on their cause and how we classify them? This is bonus points. Um, it's not well taught at medical school at this point. So yeah, we kind of touched on it, type one versus type two. Type one is what I've been going on about with regards to atherosclerosis, and that's by far the most common cause of a myocardial infarction. You have a plaque, the plaque ruptures, you have a thrombus developing, and that limits blood flow to the heart muscle. Type two is a different type of myocardial infarction, which is not caused by atherosclerosis. So it's not related to atherosclerosis, but rather it's caused by a different cause, which either results in increased oxygen demand of the heart or a reduced oxygen supply. So an example of this would be in sepsis. Okay, in sepsis, you have you know, massive vasodilation, you have a massive inflammatory response, your blood pressure drops, the blood flow and the oxygen supply to tissues massively reduces, and that predisposes you to developing a myocardial infarction. It's not necessarily to do with atherosclerosis. 
again, in anemia, the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood is low. That's going to mean your heart muscle is getting less oxygen than it should get. Um, and that you'd only see that in very, very severe anemia. I've never seen an anemia causing MI in real life. Um, and again, vasospasm is not necessarily to do with atherosclerosis, but if you do get vasospasm due to, say, cocaine ingestion, then of course that's going to limit blood supply to the heart. Okay, next question. If a patient is experiencing unstable angina, which of the following is most likely to be raised? Feel free to ask questions in the Q&A. I can see there's one at the moment. So are there more than two types of MI? There technically are, but all you need to be concerned with is type one and type two. Um, there, there are other types related to if patients have had stents put in and things, but they, they, you don't really need to concern yourself with, um, with those. In general, in hospital, you, you'll only ever see type one and type two. I've never seen type three or type four mentioned, for example. Okay. So the patient's having unstable angina they are therefore having an acute coronary syndrome, you know, they're under that umbrella term. Therefore, shouldn't the troponin be raised in all of these patients? Why have some of you put none of the above? What? For those of you who put none of the above, why have you put that? Because surely in heart problems, your troponin should be raised. Very good. So the reason is, as I said, specifically in angina, you do not get muscle infarction. Remember, going back to the pathophysiology section, in unstable angina, there is no muscle infarction. If there is no muscle infarction, you're not going to get the cardiac enzymes being released from the necrotic cells. Okay, the reason your cardiac biomarkers are raised in myocardial infarction is because you're getting muscle necrosis, the cells die and they release enzymes into the blood, such as creatine kinase, such as proteins like troponin. By an unstable angina, there is no necrosis or infarction, therefore the troponin and creatine kinase should be normal. Um, just going over, someone's asked um, about NSTEM ECG changes, so we'll come on to that. And also there's a question, are type 1 or type 2 used to classify myocardial infarction or STEMI and STEMI? Both are used, okay? Um, STEMI and NSTEMI is a classification based on the ECG changes. Type 1 and type 2 is a classification based on the cause. So two different ways of classifying a myocardial infarction. Okay, acute coronary syndrome, clinical features, they can all present in exactly the same way, chest pain, shortness of breath, but how are you gonna distinguish between them? Well, from a pathological point of view, as we said, in unstable angina, there is no infarction. In NSTEMI, you have partial infarction, and in a STEMI, you have transmural infarction. But what does that actually mean in clinical practice? How do we differentiate that? Well, firstly, um, the ECG changes. So in unstable angina, the classical changes are ST depression and T-wave inversion. In NSTEMI, the, again, the classical changes are the same, ST depression and T-wave inversion. But in a STEMI, the key differentiating factor is, that, of course, it's in the name, it's ST elevation. Also, the cardiac biomarkers, as we mentioned, in unstable angina, there is no muscle infarction. Therefore, the troponin, creatine kinase, et cetera, should be normal. In a myocardial infarction, whether that's a STEMI or an NSTEMI, the cardiac biomarkers should be raised. 
And we'll come on to what I mean by cardiac biomarkers. Um, so some of you are asking some very good ECG related questions, which I will come on to when we cover the ECG sections in a few slides. Okay, cardiac biomarkers. Which ones do we need to think about? Only really the one you need to know about is troponin, but you will read about myoglobin and creatine kinase in your textbooks. Troponin is all we use in practice. Um, if we look at these three different cardiac proteins, so the muscle cells in the heart contain these proteins, myoglobin, creatine kinase, and troponin. When the muscle cells die, they release these proteins into the blood. We can measure them. And if they are raised, that suggests muscle cell death and therefore a myocardial infarction. Myoglobin is an oxygen storing protein in muscles and it increases within two to three hours of an MI. Creatine kinase, again, going back to our first year biochemistry is involved in ATP homeostasis and phosphocreatine production. And it takes about three to six hours to increase. Troponin is involved in muscle contraction and again, it takes roughly two to three hours to increase. And there are various different isoforms of troponin, TNI, TNT, and TNC. The ones we use to check for myocardial infarction are TNI and TNT. TNC is not specific for the heart. It's also found in skeletal muscle. Therefore, it's not a very specific investigation. The reason we use troponin over myoglobin and creatine kinase is because of its higher specificity and sensitivity levels. Whereas these can be raised in a, a number of other things, troponin has higher specificity. Just going over the actual role of troponin, um, what does it do? So remember we have our actin and myosin filaments. Um, so this is actin here, the little beads, and around the actin, you have this thing called tropomyosin. When you have calcium coming into the cell and depolarizing the cell, the troponin will change the conformation of the tropomyosin and the actin, allowing, allowing myosin to bind. So that's the role of troponin in the heart muscle and in skeletal muscle. It changes the conformation of the actin, tropomyosin, um, filament and it allows myosin to bind and it allows for a muscle contraction. When you have heart muscle dying, the troponin is released into the blood and we can measure that. Uh, what's the difference between TNI and TNT? They're just slightly different structures. Okay, They're both found in the heart, so we can measure either one of them. Different hospitals will measure different ones. Uh, going back to the case, have a quick read through again, remind yourself of the case, and we'll crack on to the next question. Okay. Feel free to post your questions in the Q&A. So can an NSTEMI show nothing abnormal on an ECG? So it, the ECG can be fairly normal in an NSTEMI, actually. Um, it's atypical. Usually you should get some ST depression or T wave inversion, but if someone comes in with chest pain and a raised troponin and a normal looking ECG, you need to be worried about an NSTEMI. Why does troponin increase upon necrosis? Well, hopefully I've touched upon that. When the muscle cells die, they release the troponin into the blood. Do we get access to the recordings? They are all on the website, yes. So the patient symptoms started four hours ago. PCI is available within two hours. What's your first line management? Aspirin and clopidogrel, aspirin and prasugrel, oxygen, PCI, and thrombolysis. So this is quite a hard question actually, um, because it, the NICE guidelines have recently been updated and it is a bit unfair. Okay, so why are we giving the patient oxygen? 
what's the logic between giving the patient, should, should all patients get oxygen in a myocardial infarction? That is the big question. Yeah, so you don't give oxygen routinely unless the oxygen saturations are less than 94%. Giving a patient too much oxygen can actually be toxic to their myocardium. So only give oxygen if their saturations are low. If their saturations are normal, and in this case it was 96%, then you do not need to give oxygen. So it's an ST elevation myocardial infarction. So the ultimate management is PCI. But first, you need to give dual, you need to give antiplatelets. So the correct answer is aspirin and prasugrel according to NICE guidelines. I will also give you aspirin and clopidogrel because some hospitals still use aspirin and clopidogrel. It varies according to local guidance, but NICE say aspirin and prasugrel is first line for a STEMI. And these guidelines recently got updated in November. Okay. So let's go through the investigations and we'll come back to the management. First thing you need to do, if, you, if you're an A&E and you're worried a patient is having a myocardial infarction or an unstable angina event, you need to do an ECG and you need to do it regularly. Okay? You need to perform it every 10 minutes to see if there's any what we call dynamic change. Dynamic change means if, for example, the ECG starts off normal and then in 10 minutes, you see there's ST elevation or ST depression or T wave inversion. So dynamic change just means that the ECG waveform is changing. And that is a very worrying feature as it means the patient is actively having, you know, um, a myocardial event. We need to measure troponin and it might be normal if it's measured too early because it takes roughly two hours for it to rise to a high enough concentration for the laboratory, laboratory test to be able to pick it up. Okay, so just bear that in mind. If you measure the troponin too early after presentation or after the patient started to have chest pain, you might not actually see anything abnormal. Investigations to consider, coronary angiogram, it's diagnostic. You can see if there's any blood vessel stenosis and the timing depends on whether it's a STEMI or an unstemi, enstemi, or unstable angina. We'd always do a chest x-ray to rule out other causes of chest pain, like a pneumothorax. And you can also measure other cardiac biomarkers, but this would not routinely be done. So my question is, what's the difference between a coronary angiogram and percutaneous coronary intervention? Because students often confuse the two. What's the difference between an angiogram and PCI? Yeah, good. So angiogram is just the picture, okay? You put some contrast into the blood vessels in the heart and you can see if they are blocked or not. Percutaneous coronary intervention is the therapy. It's where you actually go and put a stent in or a balloon in to open up the artery. That's the difference. Um, good. And just a few points, I saw someone's asked a question is how often would you measure the troponin? So you'd measure it once and then you measure it again a few hours later and exactly how long after you measure it depends on the trust, but usually it's around three hours after. Um, and coronary angiogram, it's not a CT coronary angiogram. This is an IV coronary angiogram, okay? It's a bit different. Good, I can see a lot of questions rolling in and we're gonna cover all of these in the management section. So what are the ECG criteria for a STEMI versus an NSTEMI? I would just look at the basic principles. For a STEMI, you need ST elevation in two or more leads and or new left bundle branch block. If you have, if a patient just comes in with new left bundle branch block and chest pain, then that is suggestive of a diagnosis of a STEMI, even if they don't have ST elevation on their ECG. Okay, so if you just have new left bundle branch block without any ST elevation, 
that is classified as a STEMI. What is left bundle branch block? We'll go into that in our ECG webinar coming up. Um, we don't really have time to touch on it today. Going into the ST elevation in a bit more detail. So for it to be genuine ST elevation, you need to, to be present in two or more leads. In most leads, for it to be classified as elevation, it needs to be more than one millimeter. Okay, so one millimeter or more. But specifically for V2 and V3, there are set criteria. So for if you have ST elevation in V2 and V3, for it to be genuine ST elevation, it needs to meet these criteria. So two and a half millimeters or more elevation in men less than 40, two millimeters or more in men over 40, and one and a half millimeters or more in women. These are criteria set out by various organizations. I wouldn't necessarily learn them. What I would learn is ST elevation in two or more leads and or new left bundle branch block is diagnostic of a STEMI on an ECG. Okay. For an NSTEMI, the ECG criteria are ST depression in two or more leads of 0.5 millimeters or more and or T wave inversion. So for it to be genuine ischemic T wave inversion, it needs to be one millimeter deep at least. Dynamic, so that means it's changing over time. So you do an ECG and then you do another ECG 10 minutes later and the T wave inversion has changed. Either the pattern has changed, it's got deeper, it's got shallower, the T waves have flipped. That all suggests dynamic T wave inversion. But remember, Inverted T waves are normal in some leads. So this is going back to my ECG webinar. T wave inversion is normal in V1, AVR, and lead three. So bear that in mind. If you see T wave inversion V1, that doesn't mean the patient is having an end STEMI. That's just normal. Okay. So What's the diagnosis here? Good. Inferior STEMI is the one we saw earlier. Very good. So be specific, it's an inferior ST elevated myocardial infarction. As we saw earlier, you've got ST elevation in two, three, and AVF. What's the diagnosis here? So it's a lateral STEMI, okay? It's, where is the elevation? You've got elevation in AVL. You've got elevation in V5 and V6. So this is a lateral ST elevated myocardial infarction. Some of you have said uh, anterior lateral, and I understand why, because if you look at V3, V4, and V2, and maybe, yeah, so V1 to V4, there is ST depression. But to localize a STEMI, you only look at the leads where the ST elevation, well, it's not true, but the, the easiest way to localize a STEMI is to look at the leads where there is ST elevation. And ST elevation specifically in this ECG is only occurring in V5, V6, and AVL. Going back to our ECG vectors, V5, V6, AVL equals lateral, okay? I don't have any good NSTEMI um, ECGs today, unfortunately, but I've got this graphic. So this is a normal ECG. The ST segment is flat. When you look at it, you compare it to this segment here, and you can see it's flat and on the same level. ST elevation, ST segment gets pushed up, and an ST depression, the ST segment gets pushed downwards. So in a STEMI, you will get, of course, ST elevation. <clears throat> 
You can also get ST depression as we saw in the last ECG. So if you have ST elevation, you can also get, sorry, if you have a STEMI, you can get a combination of ST elevation and ST depression. In an NSTEMI, you will never get ST elevation, okay? You usually get ST depression, which looks like this, and you can also get T wave inversion in an NSTEMI, which looks like this. So the T wave goes the wrong way. The interesting thing is an NSTEMI cannot be localized on ECG. It's not really understood why this is the case, but you cannot look at the leads and figure out where the myocardial infarction is occurring like you can with a STEMI. So like we just did in the last case, we could say this was a lateral STEMI and this is an inferior STEMI. But with an NSTEMI, you cannot localize where the infarction is occurring based on the ECG findings alone. And it's not really properly understood why that's the case, um, but it's just a point that you should be aware of. Okay, general management principles. I'm sure you've all come across MONA or MONAC at uni um, and during your studies, but actually I don't like this because it's not entirely accurate because you don't always give oxygen and you don't always give clopidogrel. So you only give oxygen if the saturations are less than 94%. You should give analgesia, morphine is usually very good and GTN, which is a vasodilator and will increase blood supply to the heart and relieve some pain. You should give dual antiplatelets. You always give aspirin plus one other antiplatelet agent. Okay, so it's aspirin plus one other antiplatelet agent, either clopidogrel, ticagrelor, or prasugrel. You also give anticoagulation and percutaneous coronary intervention depending on the circumstances. But let's dive into the actual management of a STEMI to begin with. So this is the acute management, i.e. management on the same day. The patient's turned up and you've diagnosed an SC elevated myocardial infarction. Step one, if ever you suspect a myocardial infarction, this is the take home point really and the really important learning point. If you ever suspect a myocardial infarction, give aspirin, high dose aspirin. And after that, you can figure out what to do because the aspirin might actually save the patient's life, okay? It will stop that plaque from building up and blocking the blood supply. So that's why aspirin antiplatelets are really important from stopping that thrombus formation going back to pathophysiology. Again, that's why it's important to understand pathophysiology. So you diagnose a STEMI, you give aspirin high dose, and then you figure out when the symptoms occurred. If the symptoms occurred less than 12 hours ago and PCI is available in two hours, then you go down this pathway. If one of these criteria are not met, then you go down this pathway here. So let's go down the PCI pathway. If the patient's symptoms happened less than 12 hours ago and PCI is available in two hours, both criteria must be met. Then you give them a second antiplatelet agent. NICE suggests Prasugrel. You give them unfractionated heparin and a combination of uh, further antiplatelets and anticoagulants such as a glycoprotein 2B3A inhibitor and bivalirudin. And then you take them to the cath lab and you can conduct percutaneous coronary intervention. That's where they put a stent in or a balloon in to open up the coronary artery. The key take home message there is symptoms less than 12 hours and PCI available in two hours, give a second antiplatelet agent, anticoagulate the patient and take them for PCI. The specific you know, if, it, if you're giving bivalirudin or GP2B3A inhibitors, that's not too important. You won't be tested on that in your exam. What you will be tested on is aspirin 300 milligrams, the time criteria, um, the fact that you give a second antiplatelet agent and some anticoagulation, but the specifics aren't too important. And then you go to PCI. Uh, 
if the patient is not eligible for PCI, so let's say PCI is available in two hours, but the patient's symptoms occurred 24 hours ago, then they do not meet both of these criteria. Alternatively, if their symptoms have occurred within 12 hours, but you can't get them to a PCI lab within two hours, then you go down the fibrinolysis route. Fibrinolysis and thrombolysis are the same word. They mean the same thing, okay? Give the patient something like alteplase, and the idea is that will help open up the coronary artery. You then give them a, a second antiplatelet agent as well, such as ticagrelor. So NICE suggests if you're going down the fibrinolysis pathway, ticagrelor is the go-to second antiplatelet agent. The final caveat to this is if from fibrinolysis does not work, then you can take the patient to the PCI lab to open up their arteries with stents and balloons. The way you check to see if fibrinolysis is work is you conduct an ECG roughly one hour after fibrinolysis, um, after starting fibrinolysis. And if there is still residual ST elevation, that means the fibrinolysis has not worked and you take the patient to the cath lab. This is based on the NICE 2020 guidelines, which were updated in November. So you must know this and just be aware the guidelines have been updated in November. Okay, how do we treat NSTEMI or unstable angina? So these are managed in exactly the same way. Unstemi and unstable angina are managed in exactly the same way. Remember, in both NSTEMI and unstable angina, actually, you can get ST depression and T wave inversion. The difference is in an NSTEMI, the troponin should be raised, but in unstable angina, the troponin will be normal because you're not having muscle infarction. Step one, as always, you give aspirin 300 milligrams. That's the take home message. If you suspect ACS, give aspirin high dose because that might save a life. You also give an anticoagulant. So fondaparinux is the usual anticoagulant you'll give. But if the patient is going for PCI urgently, then you give unfractionated heparin. So I'll come back to the anticoagulant point in a second. The point is end stem your unstable angina. Step one, give high dose aspirin. Step two, give an anticoagulant. The specifics aren't too important for your exams. And then step three is you risk stratify the patient. So you figure out, are they low risk or are they intermediate to high risk? Or are they clinically unstable? So when we say clinically unstable, I'm not talking about unstable angina, but I mean, are they clinically unwell? Is their blood pressure dropping? You know, are their OBS going all over the place? Um, what are their blood results doing? that's clinically unstable. You know, are they going into heart failure? These are all clinically uh, signs of clinical instability. So my question is, how do we risk stratify these patients? What scale do we use to risk stratify patients with NSTEMI or unstable angina? Grace, yes, good. The Grace score, which I'll come on to next. So the GRACE score risk stratifies patients, and if they're low risk, all you do is you give aspirin, anticoagulant, and a second antiplatelet agent, NICE suggests ticagrelor first line, okay? If the patient is intermediate to high risk, you, you give them a second antiplatelet agent, and you take them to the cath lab within 72 hours. The cath lab is a place where PCI takes place. So within 72 hours, you take them to the cath lab to open up their coronary arteries with either a stent or a balloon, for example, or both. If the patient is clinically unstable, then you take them to the cath lab straight away, okay, as soon as you can get there. Um, and you do PCI immediately with a second plant antiplatelet agent as well. So going back to this anticoagulant um, that I was talking about earlier, if the patient is low risk or intermediate to high risk, you give fondaparinux. 
But if the patient is clinically unstable and going for PCI immediately, we give unfractionated heparin. So only if the patient is going for PCI soon do you give unfractionated heparin. If they're having PCI in 72 hours or they're not having PCI at all in the acute setting, you give fondaparinux. Updated NICE 2020 guidelines. GRACE score. This is how we risk stratify patients. So the GRACE score risk stratifies patients by estimating six month mortality and it takes into account these factors, age, heart rate, blood pressure, creatinine, your ECG changes, cardiac enzymes, and if the patient has heart failure. And of course, the more of these factors you have, the higher your GRACE score and the higher your risk. So if a patient is low risk, their six month mortality is less than 3%. Intermediate risk means their six month mortality is three to 8% or high risk is greater than 8%. So going back to our flow chart, intermediate and high risk patients are taken for PCI in 72 hours. Low risk patients can be discharged with dual antiplatelets. So we've talked about the acute management within the first few days, but how do we manage these patients going forward? And that is known as secondary prevention. Secondary prevention means the patient has already had the acute coronary syndrome issue, and now we need to treat them to stop them from happening again, okay, to stop it from happening again. Lifestyle changes, diet, exercise, stop smoking. Manage cardiovascular risk. If they have blood pressure issues, treat it. If they have diabetes, make sure that's treated. And all patients will be started on high dose statin to reduce their cholesterol levels. What antiplatelet therapy do you use going forward? Patients continue aspirin, this time low dose aspirin, pretty much for the rest of their lives. And they will continue their second antiplatelet agent usually for one year, but a cardiologist will make this decision. They will be on dual antiplatelets for a year, and after that, they will continue aspirin alone for pretty much the rest of their life. You will start them on an ACE inhibitor and a beta blocker, and you'll send them for cardiac rehabilitation, which is like an exercise program for people with heart problems. Okay, we're finishing off now. Last couple of slides. Um, I threw in a top decile question in here. I hope it's not too, uh, too easy. Oh, so the faster you answer, the more points you get. I, don't, I, just really, I don't think I gave you guys enough time. Um, 15 seconds. Patient with STEMI five months ago presents with left arm weakness. His ECG is shown. What's the diagnosis? Sorry, I don't think I gave you enough time on that. That was my bad. There's a ventricular aneurysm. Uh, let me show you why. Let's see who, uh, who actually got it. Well done, SJ, one of the three people to have uh, got that right. Let's have a look. So what do we see on the ECG? So this patient, going back to the question, the patient's had a STEMI five months ago and he's presenting with left arm weakness. What does his ECG show? Any takers? So good, there's ST elevation in V3. So you can see there's ST elevation in V3, in V4, and in V5. Maybe a bit in V6 as well, but it's hard to see on the computer screen. So, the patient has had a STEMI five months ago and now has ST elevation on their ECG. So surely the answer is recurrent STEMI. 
why is the answer ventricular aneurysm? Well, I guess only three of you got it right, so it probably was quite tricky, but the, the reason is the classical presentation of ventricular aneurysm is a couple of months after the patient has had a myocardial infarction, they have persistent ST elevation on their ECG, okay? There's no indication this patient is having a myocardial infarction. There's no chest pain. There's no shortness of breath. That doesn't exclude, that doesn't mean they can't be having another STEMI, but what else do we have in the history? The patient has left arm weakness, okay? Why does the patient have left arm weakness? So you need to tie a few concepts together here. It's a bit tricky. Why is a patient having left arm weakness? Okay, so let, let's take it through step by step. Patients had a STEMI five months ago. Their ventricular wall is now weakened because part of it is infarcted. They've developed a ventricular aneurysm. The way that presents on ECG is persistent ST elevation, okay? When you have an aneurysm, an aneurysm is an out bulge, like this bulging area in the ventricular wall. It's where the muscle has infarcted and become very thin and fibrotic and weak. So you have this bulge occurring. What's gonna happen in this bulge area? What happens in any aneurysm? You get turbulent blood flow. And what does turbulent blood flow lead to? Good, so as Hadra has mentioned it, you get a clot forming, okay? So exactly, and then the clots go off to the brain, you get a stroke and you get left arm weakness in this case. Um, so I think that was a nice little case, but let's just quickly walk that through again. He's had a STEMI five months ago. His ventricular wall is now weak. He's formed an aneurysm in his ventricle because of the weakening of the ventricle wall. The way that presents on ECG is persistent ST elevation. Okay, persistent e ST elevation. And in this case, we can see it in V3, V4, V5. He's got persistent ST elevation. He's got evidence of a stroke because he's forming clots in this area here and they are flying off to the brain. And that is a complication of myocardial infarction. Complications, this is the final slide pretty much, can be split up into early and late. Early complications include arrhythmias, and these can lead to cardiac arrest, um, heart failure and cardiogenic shock because your heart is not functioning as it should. You're not pumping blood around the body as you should. You go into shock. Pericarditis, that's because Necrosis leads to inflammation of the actual heart um, pericardium, and you develop pericarditis. Ventricular septal defect. If you have an infarction of the septum, that's going to lead to a defect in the septum. You can get valvular incompetence like mitral regurgitation if the papillary muscles are affected. Or in a very severe case, you can actually have the entire uh, or part of the ventricular wall rupturing, and that would obviously be catastrophic. If part of your ventricle ruptures, you're going to bleed out very quickly. Late complications include Dressler's syndrome. Okay, what is Dressler's syndrome? This happens six, typically two to six weeks after the event, after a myocardial infarction, and it's an autoimmune pericarditis. So two to six weeks after having a myocardial infarction, you can develop an autoimmune pericarditis. It's different from this type of pericarditis, which is triggered by inflammation from necrotic muscle cells. And this typically happens in the first few days. Obviously, if you have an infarcted muscle tissue, you're gonna develop chronic heart failure. And as we discussed, you can also develop ventricular aneurysms, which present with persistent ST elevation and predispose patients to developing strokes. Uh, this is a summary here. I'm not gonna go through it, but basically goes through everything we've discussed um, about acute coronary syndrome, 
and it's this whole this whole lecture in a nutshell. So interestingly, in the 60s, over 70% of MIs were fatal, but now survival is roughly 70%. So we've come a long way. So next time we have our competition in two weeks, roughly 100 pounds up for grab. Sign up to our website with the um, discount code GKT2021 and you'll get 20 to 30% off. Um, and please do fill out, fill out the feedback form. I will stick around to fill in, sorry, I'll stick, stick around to uh, answer any questions you guys have. So please do post them in the Q&A.